Physics Notes, Unit 25C, Geometric Optics. We started off with Snell's Law, Refraction, Bending of Light. That was very applicable to lenses. But now we're talking about mirrors, which work on the principle of reflection. So let's define a mirror. We look in a mirror every day, most likely. A mirror is a surface that produces specular reflection, which I will define here in a couple minutes. But polished metals make good mirrors. Technically, glass is not a good mirror surface. It does reflect. It does reflect in a specular fashion. And glass is used in most mirrors, but it's not really the reflective surface of the mirror. There's usually like a metal paint, a paint on the back of the glass. More on that in a minute. But glass is a transparent medium that only reflects about 4 to 5 percent of incident light. So you can get a, an image in, in glass, just glass by itself. But once again, as I've kind of noted here in the next sentence, even though uh, reflection from glass is specular, glass is not the mirrored surface. What there is is a thin metallic paint painted on the back of the glass. That's the reflective surface for most mirrors. The mirror in your bathroom, there's like metallic paint. The glass is there to kind of hold the paint. It's a cheap way to make a mirror because metals, thick metals, polished metals are more expensive and they're actually not quite as good as the metallic paint that you can put on the back of glass. They make very good mirrors, that, that metallic silvery paint painted on the back of the glass. Anyway, Specular reflection is reflection off a smooth, quote unquote, optically smooth surface. Then we have diffuse reflection, reflection off a rough surface. All surfaces basically reflect some light. Well, it reflects the color of light that it is. A red surface reflects red light. A blue surface reflects blue light. A white surface reflects basically all colors of light. It might absorb a little bit, but like uh, on the left over here, specular reflection, that's basically mirror reflection. Incoming light all reflects off in the same parallel fashion that it comes in at the angle of reflection, obeys the law of reflection. The surface looks really smooth, so you can form images, as we'll talk about here in a few minutes, with diffuse reflection, this would be a reflection more like, off a, like a, off a wall. Even though each individual ray still follows the law of reflection, if you drew the normal at each situation, I'm going to attempt to do this for the very last, for the very last ray here. There's a ray coming in. It comes in like this. Ooh, not too bad. Oops, that's incoming. And then outgoing. That's supposed to be straight. The normal there, the normal to that surface looks something like this. Here's the normal. So that reflective ray highlighted there still obeys the law of reflection, but it's just that that surface is not smooth, so it's kind of hitting the side of a hill. Anyway, I'll just mark off that those two angles are equal. That obeys the law of reflection. But we're not going to be dealing with diffuse reflection here. Most things in life, though, are diffuse reflectors. And once again, uh, most things reflect the light. Well, it reflects the color of light that it appears. Red things reflect red light. They absorb the other colors. Let's talk about a flat mirror for a second here, or for a few minutes here. Here's a person looking in a mirror, and I'll kind of give you the answer before I explain this more fully. It turns out that a full-length mirror only needs to be half the height of the person that uses it. So if you're a six-foot person, a full-length mirror for you is only three feet tall. Let me prove that to you. Uh, so plain mirror here, plain mirror here is a flat mirror, a flat mirror. And it has no focal point, or the focal length is infinity. The image produced is always virtual. Let me go back to that infinity thing. If you go back to the 1 over d sub 0 plus 1 over d sub i equals 1 over f, okay, if you make this infinitely big, then 1 over f equals 0, basically. So if 1 over a big number, so 1 over f equals 0. 1 over f equals 0. So one of, if 1 over f equals 0, I'm going to go down here lower, I'm going to have 1 over d sub 0 plus 1 over d sub i equals 0. 
Or in other words, 1 over d sub 0 equals negative 1 over d sub i. And if you flip that, that means d sub o equals negative d sub i. In other words, the image and the object distance are the same. Now I'm going to show you that in the diagram as well. So here's the thing. Once again, when you see things, here we have the, the person on the left, and we have their virtual image on the right. The clue that it's a virtual image is it's upright. The only thing different between the object and the image is that if this was you, if you raised your right hand, your image would raise its left hand. So left and right are reversed. But it's a virtual image. It's upright. And flat mirrors are nice because you always end up with a virtual image. The image is always the same size as the object. And the mirror only needs to be half the size of the object to, in order to see your whole self. Now, here's the geometry of it. When you see things, it's because light is going into your, into your eyes. Now, if I take the person on the left, let's just make it simple. Let's say this person is six feet tall. So that's six feet, basically two meters. I mean, it's pretty easy to see here that the image is six feet, but before I assume that, I mean, it's a pretty logical conclusion just by looking at this. The bottom line is for you to see something, light has to go into your eyes. So on the left-hand side here, this is showing you like your, your two extremes are the, your feet and the top of your head are your two extremes of your, your height. So if I take light that's coming from your foot, so there's a beam of light, and there's light reflecting off your entire body, your knees, your arms, your elbows, your shoulders, okay? But if I want to establish the extremes of your body, you start with your foot, okay? So that would be the lowest part there. I could use my toes there. They're, they're using your, their ankle, doesn't matter. Toes, ankle. But that light comes in, obeys the law of reflection as it shows you there. But once again, when you look in the mirror, when you look in the mirror, okay, that is going into your eye. So that's supposed to be going into your eye, which, okay, my mind's a little off there. But that goes in your eye. So your brain says, and rightly so, your brain says that light travels in a straight line, which it does. So when you're looking in the mirror, right, what your brain says is that your foot looks like it's over there. That's where it looks like your foot is at. Even though the light is coming from your actual foot, your brain says there's something back there. There's nothing back there. It's the, it's the next room behind your bathroom. So that fat mirror is on your bathroom wall. This image, okay, is behind the mirror. Okay, it's not in the mirror. That's another way we talk. We say the image is in the mirror. Well, as we were kind of talking about with, with lenses, right? These locations are not actually in the lens or in the mirror. They're in space, either behind or in front of the mirror or lens. So that's a little bit of a bizarre thing because we kind of have this mindset maybe that images are in the mirror. No, they're behind, especially a flat mirror, they're actually behind a mirror. Another way you can prove this is if you're looking in a mirror, you look in the mirror, that's how we talk, there looks like there's depth perception in the mirror. In other words, if you're looking in a mirror and you take a step back, what does the image do? It takes a step back. If you take a step forward, it takes a step forward. So what I'm trying to prove here, which looks pretty reasonable, that if you're, say, four feet in front of the mirror, your image is four feet behind the mirror. It doesn't actually exist. It's an optical illusion. But that's how we talk about, in physics, where the image is. Literally, that's where it would be. Now, with a flat mirror, it's a virtual image. You cannot project this on a screen. So it's a virtual image. It's an optical illusion. Let me let me do the uh, the other extreme, the top of the, the top of the head. So from the top of the head, I'm gonna do a little bit better job than that. From the top of the head, there's a there's a ray of light. Oh, let me try. I, I can be full of all kinds of excuses. The light goes in straight line. Okay, then it goes into the eye. All right, but your brain once again, I'm gonna follow a dash line. Your brain says the top of your head's back there. So it's the bottom of your feet's down there. Your foot is there. You see things because light comes into your eyes. It's not because light comes out of your eyes. Your brain says light goes in a straight line. It says light's coming from back there when it's actually not coming from back there. It's coming from the top of your head and from your foot and from all other parts of your body. I can draw millions of these rays from all parts of your body. But bottom line here, it's not too hard to imagine this geometrically, all right, that even to scale, even to scale, I'm just going to do a loose proof here, that that's six feet tall. That's six feet. Now, what happens here is this, and, and there's going to be some homework problems based on this as well. If we, 
if we look at this if we look at this triangle right here if I go down okay this is supposed to be a triangle oh boy All right so that's a triangle I'll just highlight it again there's the top of the triangle there's this okay I'm having trouble because of my angle here so I'm highlighting that blue triangle on the right hand side it's six feet tall all right and then I'll just highlight really largely in blue okay so this arrow that's not actual light okay but that represents light going towards your eyes the actual lights over here on the left I have already highlighted that that's the actual light going to your eyes all right and it comes to a point in your eye over here on the left so that's going into your eye well if you look at that triangle just geometrically speaking all right I'm gonna drop a line down for the mirror okay so let's say let's say she's actually standing four feet from the mirror well geometrically speaking you can prove by angles and so forth that the image is four feet behind the mirror and I actually already proved that over here on the right with my algebra and the lens equation or the mirror equation where 1 over f is well that focal length is infinity so 1 over f is 0 that do equals the opposite or negative di in other words the image distance here is negative so technically the object in this particular example in my example I have d sub o equals 4 feet that little tick mark means feet and d sub i equals negative 4 feet all right four feet behind the mirror it's negative it's virtual so the di is negative 4 but what you can prove here all right if that total length is 8 meters which it is from object to image so if they ask you how far is it from the object to the image it's 8 meters total from the object to image and the mirror the mirror is halfway between the object and image so I'm going to highlight the mirror now so here's the mirror all right and the person over here on the right I'm going to highlight that is 6 feet that's six feet where I'm highlighting now on the far right that's six feet and her eye basically comes to a point of zero feet if you go halfway from the image to where the mirror is the mirror has to be half of six feet it's got to be half of six feet okay it's got to be half of the total height of the person just by geometry so the mirror is three feet that's how tall the mirror is what I'm trying to prove to you right there with that little illustration and basic geometry is that a full-length mirror technically is only half your size now the reason why they make full-length mirrors more than three feet is because if you have a little a little kid that wants to use this mirror like a four foot tall kid would technically only need a two foot mirror to be a full-length mirror but they would need the mirror to be lower towards the ground so it has to be in the right spot so so to avoid that issue where different size people have to be in a you know you have to put the mirror in a different spot we don't move the mirror the mirror stays in one spot on, on the wall we make it like four or five feet tall you know most full-length mirrors are not six feet tall they're like four or five feet and then they put them in a, in a spot on the wall so the you know all people can look in the mirror and see their full self the other thing that they're going to ask you for and I'm going to erase a little bit here actually I'm going to erase quite a bit here what the other thing they're going to ask you to do all right is to figure out how where do you have to put the mirror like for this particular person if the person is six feet tall uh, where do you put this mirror okay because the top of the mirror is not at the six foot mark the top of the mirror is not six feet so what they're going to tell you is like a problem like this if the distance from the top of her head to her eyeball say that that is say that that is six inches or um, well, let's, say, let's say it's let's say it's let's say it's ten centimeters let's say it's ten centimeters 10 centimeters all right so from the top of her head to her eye is 10 centimeter all right so that top ray that goes into her eye the one that comes across okay it has to fall five centimeters down and then five more centimeters down to get into her eye so it's a total drop of 10 centimeters so in other words the top of the mirror is five centimeters below the six feet and now I'm in in uh, different units so I guess I should, I should go back to let's say that that instead of six, 10 centimeters let's say that that was six inches six inches sorry six inches so that's a drop of six inches so it's a drop total drop of six inches drop of three inches on the way to the mirror in other words the top of the mirror has to be three inches three inches below six feet if she's a six-foot person 
So six, the top of the mirror is six, uh, three inches below six feet. And six feet is what, 72 inches? Uh, I believe so, 72 inches. So the top of the mirror would have to be at um, 69 inches on the wall. 69 inches on the wall. Or they'll say, where's the, where's the bottom of the mirror? Well, the bottom of the mirror is going to be three inches below the three foot mark. So three feet is 36 inches. So it'll be 33 inches. So this would be, if we're doing it in inches, all right, this would be 33 inches. In other words, it's not three feet off the ground. If it's three feet off the ground, that's 36 inches. That would put the top of the mirror at the top of her head at, at 72 inches at six feet. But the top of the mirror does not have to be at six feet. So I need to think about that a little bit. You move the mirror down just a little bit. You move it down. You move the mirror down from the top of her head by half the distance from her forehead to her eyes or the top, the top of your head to your eyes. So if, that, if that's eight inches from your eyes to the top of your head, you've got to have the top of the mirror four inches below the total height of the person. Okay, so that's basically everything there is to know. Well, not everything, but pretty much everything for this unit you'll need to know about flat mirrors. Now, it gets interesting with curved mirrors, curved mirrors. And the math is very, very similar, like I've mentioned before, with lenses. We have two types of mirrors. We have concave, converging. They have a positive focal length. Positive focal length, that's this one over here. They actually cause light to focus to a point. We call it the focal point, and we're going to call that capital F. Little f will be the focal length. So we're going to call this point over here capital F. They have little f there. And the focal length will be from there to there. That'll be the focal length. Let me change to a different color here. So that will be the focal length, little f. All right, it'll be positive. For the diverging mirror, negative focal length. So, the, so this is going to be capital F over here. And then the focal length will be from the mirrored surface back there. That will be F. That will be a negative number. It's a virtual focal point. The convex mirrors, the diverging mirrors, always give you a virtual image. A diverging lens always does as well. Diverging lenses or mirrors always give you a virtual image. So in other words, D sub I will always be negative. And M will always be less than 1. It's true for diverging mirrors, diverging lenses. All right, so let's go through some of the di diagrams and the calculations. And there's a lot, a lot of similarities between mirrors and lenses. All right, so I have steps one, two, and three, very similar to what we did with, um, with lenses. You can see a lot of similarities. So we have an object here. Now they put everything on one diagram. They put four rays. On your diagrams, you only need two rays. Three is a check. They put a fourth one in there just for kind of fun or just because there could be millions of rays of light from the top of the object. Here they're using an object as an arrow. And there are three basic ray tracing techniques that help you locate images. They've already done this problem for you. And then they have the eyeball over here that then is observing. Light goes into your eye and that person's eye will see an image that's uh, upside down, a real image in this case. This is a converging uh, mirror. Now what you'll see me do a lot of times is uh, I'll put like little hash marks back here to show you that that's the back of the mirror. All right, so don't, sometimes I don't do that. Some books do that. Like, like That's the back of the mirror. The front, so the front is what you see here. That's the reflective surface. I did pretty good there. That's the reflective surface. Um, so concave mirror. You can do this with a spoon, like a kitchen spoon and take a big spoon I say look at the business side of the spoon, the side of the spoon that you actually use to, to eat stuff with, not the back side of the spoon, okay? But the business side of the spoon, the inside of the spoon. If you, if you take a spoon out and look at it, you look there, you will see, if you hold it away from your face, you will see an image of yourself inverted, a real image, a real image of yourself inverted. And that image is in front of the spoon, which is kind of goes against your gut again, once, once again, because in a flat mirror, your image is always behind the mirror. In a concave mirror like this, your image is actually in front of the mirror. So that's something you got to get used to. And they're kind of proving it here with a, with a ray diagram. But with concave mirrors, you can get real or virtual images. I'm going to go through those in here in a few minutes. But they have the center of curvature marked off. The center of curvature is twice the focal length. So we have the center of curvature right here along the principal axis, the focal length, focal point. And we don't have any numbers here. They're just showing the basic general ideas. And so step one, you have a ray of light that comes in parallel. Oh, not bad. 
Step one, ray of light comes in parallel. Just like for a lens, but for a lens, it goes through the lens and goes through the refracts through the focal point. This one reflects through the focal point. It obeys the law of reflection, which we don't have to measure off here, but it goes through the focal point. Not bad. Okay, watch out. I don't want to get too prideful there. I did pretty good, though. So it's a reflected ray, uh, but the colors are getting messed up here. I should have used blue. So I'm going to erase that, but I just drew that to show you that that's what it does. Okay, that's, the, that's step number one when you're doing this for yourself. You're going to draw that ray uh, that goes parallel and through F. Now, they, have, they kind of have steps two and three. I'm going to, I'm going to change this up. So uh, this one, this one I'm, going to, I'm going to do is number three. Three. This is number three on my list, and then this one is number, where's my number two? Oh, this is number two. So they switched numbers here. So this one's number two. So number two is the purple one that they have here. Let's see if I can go to purple. So number two is the one that goes through the center of curvature. In other words, you have a ray of light. You have a ray of light that comes down, hits the mirror. It reflects straight back onto itself. So that one reflects straight back onto itself. That's number two. That's like the one that goes through the center of a lens. It doesn't bend at all any substantial amount in a thin lens and here this one doesn't bend it or uh, change direction at all it just bend, reflects back on top of itself because it's hitting the mirror perpendicular to the mirror all right I'm gonna get rid of that all right and then step three and once again you don't need to do all three steps on these but step three is a ray of light that goes through the focal point so that one's red in the diagram in the diagram it's red so it comes in goes through the focal point through the focal point, then it hits the mirror and it bounces parallel. That was number three. All right, so steps one, two, and three, you draw those three rays. And they all should intersect in one spot, and here they, they do really well because this one was set up. And the, where they intersect is the image location for the top of the arrow. That's where we started from the object. We started from the top of the arrow for the object. We end up at the top of the image location. They drew a fourth one in here that you do not need to draw. In fact, you'll just probably be drawing two of these, probably steps one and two instead of, you might not even use step three. Step three is sometimes difficult to do. And they're just showing you that you could draw more. Step four be any kind of semi-random, not, not completely random, uh, a ray that hits the mirror uh, at the point of where the principal axis intersects the, the mirror. And it reflects, once again, all, all of these reflect through the image location, top of the arrow. And you could draw millions more. I'll do one and then erase it. Like I could just draw a random. Oh man, that's not good. I can draw another one. All right, that's just random. But I do know that now that's going to come through. It's going to go through that point. I can draw millions, millions more. They're all going to come through. If I start at the tip of the object, it'll go through that point for the tip of the image. And I could do that for any part of the object. It will map onto the same. If I if I take a, a, the middle of the object, like right there, and I did the, repeated this experiment, it would end up all intersecting right here at the middle of the image. But I'm not going to do that. It just messes up the diagram. You won't have to do that. That's for a converging mirror. Uh, let's go to the diverging mirror. All right, so the same rules apply. Uh, a line that comes in parallel, line that comes in parallel. Once again, these hit the mirror and they diverge. And they diverge such that, this is step one, that the projection comes from the virtual focal point. So that's the way you draw a, the first step for ray tracing for a diverging mirror. That's step one. Then step two, I'm going to switch these up. This is step two, and this is step three. So step two is one that's heading towards the center of curvature. So step two is a line or a ray that's heading towards C. I'll project this back. That reflects straight back. So that ray of light reflects straight back like that. Those are the two that we'll probably be drawing. Instead of drawing four, we'll just draw those two, and we find where they intersect. And when they already intersect right there, well, let me do uh, number three. It's in red. Number three is one that's going towards F. Number three is one that's going towards F. I wanted to use red. It's going towards F. So that's heading towards F. It reflects parallel. All right, so I have three reflected rays. I had number one number two and number three, those are my three reflected rays, you project them backwards and they all backwards end up at that location right there where that dot is where I have my cursor right now. That's the top of my image. 
So like I've said before, you always get a virtual upright image, always small. So these are diverging mirrors. You see these like in stores for security cameras. They're also in your on your car mirrors, on your um, side view mirrors. A lot of times it'll say, beware, objects are closer than they appear. Because when you look in this kind of mirror, when you look at this kind of mirror, things look smaller. And when they look smaller, you think they're further away than they are. That's why they have that warning on your side view mirror. The nice thing about these kinds of convex mirrors is they give you a wider angle view that you can see more things, so you don't have as big of a blind spot, but it makes things appear farther away, so you gotta, you got to factor that in. All right, and once again, your eyeball, your eyeball over here, and there's more than one ray of light. Here they just have number four, which we're not going to draw number four, tells you that, oh, that light's coming from behind the mirror. So it's kind of like a flat mirror in a sense where you get a virtual image, but it's, it's not as far behind the mirror as the object is in front of the mirror. It makes things look smaller. So you always get a virtual image, and that one literally is behind a mirror, which is probably more comfortable for people to, to come to grips with because in flat mirrors you always get an image behind the mirror. So let's practice this mathematically. All right, ray tracing and math. So here we go. We're going to draw the ray tracing diagram and then do the math to confirm our diagrams. So we have a converging mirror here. We're going to do the same basic things we did with lenses. We're going to find the whether it's real or virtual, the location, and then the magnification. So we have here that we have a concave mirror. And once again, what, what I sometimes do is I'll put like hash marks on the back. I guess I don't need to do that. That's the back of the mirror. I always do these from left to right. Just like lens problems, I do them from left to right. You can do these from right to left. Don't know if there's any examples in a book from right to left. Most books do everything from left to right. So you can always set up your mirror to do the problem left to right. Just a little bit keeps things a little bit more organized. So you can always change the problem up and draw it from left to right. Okay, so we have uh, the center of curvature, C, green dot, and focal point, which is half as far away. So the, I know the radius of curvature here is 40. So I from the from this is 40 from here. So there is 40 centimeters. I'm going to erase that. So the focal length is 20. I'm going to erase that too. That's 20, but I'll use that as a calculation. So, okay, let's get rid of that. Sorry. Okay, uh, but it says we have an object at 30 centimeters. I'm going to use, uh, I'll use the candle again. So here's the, here's the, here's the candle. Not, not too bad. So because my focal length is 20, and my center of curvature is 40, my object is halfway between my focal point and my center of curvature. So I'm going to draw the diagram. So I have a ray of light. This is step number one, a ray of light. That represents light coming from the candle. And there's light from the candle. A lot of the light from the candle doesn't even hit the mirror. It goes up into space. You don't need to draw this, but there's a ray of light that goes this way, a ray of light that goes this way. I mean, there's rays of light that go every direction from that candle, most of which, like I say, doesn't hit the mirror. I'm going to erase those. Okay, so... But we have that one particular ray of light that hits the mirror, reflects off, and goes through F. Not too bad. It's supposed to go right through F. Then you have step two, which is very difficult to draw for this mirror, the one that goes through the center of curvature. So I'm going to skip step two. Sometimes, and I'll, as we go through here, pick the two that are easy. Uh, the Step two is difficult here. I'm not going to go through that one. Step three, though, the one that goes through the focal point, that's supposed to be a straight line. Goes through the focal point, hits the mirror, and then goes that way. So that's number three. And that intersection there, that intersection tells you where the image of the flame is going to be. So my image itself, there's the candle, that's the flame, that's going to be my image. It's real. So by the basics of the diagram, it's real and it's magnified. And it looks like it's beyond the 40 centimeter mark. But it's real because, well, you can tell because it's inverted, but it's also because it's actual light that intersects. My diagram isn't too bad, but let's see how well I did by calculation. So the calculation is 1 over d sub 0 plus 1 over d sub i equals 1 over f. So I'm going to plug in here 1 over my d sub 0 is 30 plus 1 over d sub i equals 1 over 20 because the focal length equals one-half the radius of curvature. So in this case, the focal length was one-half of 40. So the focal length was 20 centimeters. These are all centimeters. Okay, I'm going to do the math here. So I, I went ahead and did all the math. So you have 1 over 30 plus 1 over d sub i 
equals 1 over 20. So you do all the math there. Move the 1 over 30 to the right, put those in decimal form, subtract the two decimals, then take the inverse of 0 0.017, you get d sub i is 59 centimeters, which is not too, it's consistent with my diagram. Because I said my image distance was more than 40. My diagram's not perfect, and your diagram might not be perfect either if you draw a diagram. They're not going to be perfect because we're just, I, I didn't even use a ruler. If you use a ruler, it's better. And you might get closer. But even with a ruler, you, you might get some, you'll have some issues. But bottom line, how do I know then based on this calculation? So sometimes you just do the calculation. D sub i is 59. Well, because it's positive, I know my image is real. So that's how, how I know part A, real image, positive 59. Well, I have then by calculation B, my image distance is 59. That's the location. And then C, magnification is negative D sub i over D sub o. So I have negative 59, whoopsie, over 30, which is basically negative 2.0 if you go to two sig figs. So the magnification is negative two. It's twice as large and it's in inverted. And that's pretty close. I have a large, roughly twice as large of an image as than, than the object. So converging mirror, first example. Uh, second example, concave converging mirror. I'm going to erase a few things here. Okay. Um, let's draw the diagram. We're going to go a little bit faster this time. Radius of curvature is 50, so oh, I can do the calculation first. R, R equals 50, so F equals one half of 50. I mean, I hardly need to write that down. F equals 25 centimeters. That'll be useful. Oh man, uh, F equals 25 centimeters. That'll be useful in the calculation. All right, it says that D sub zero, that D oh not, not D sub zero, D sub object is 15. Well, the 25 is important because F is 25. My object is around here. I'm going to draw my object as a candle. So my object is inside the focal length. Focal length is 25. The object length is 15. So I'm closer to the mirror than the focal length. So it gets a little tricky here. Ray of light coming in parallel. Hits the mirror. Bounces through F. So it looks like that. Not too bad. Once again, step number two, well, I'll do all three steps this time. This one's tricky. If I line up, though, if I line up, like, like right there, so I'm lining up with C. So my two points are the flame and C. So if I have a, if I have a ray of light, okay, a ray of light, let me do a little better job than that, uh, a, a ray of light that's lined up with that, so that's a ray of light lined up at C. It hits the mirror and it reflects back. That's, that's step number two, which I didn't do in the first example. It hits the mirror straight on, perpendicular to the surface, to a tangent, and it reflects straight back on itself. Those two, those two lines are already diverging. And I'm not going to do step three in this case. Step three is a little bit tricky. Well, I will do step three. Step three would be a line, a line that lines up with F, so that would line up with F, hits the mirror, so that lines up, so those are my three. That one comes out parallel. Okay, so you can do all three, or just two of these three. Number one is almost always the easiest. Steps two and three, sometimes step two is easier than step three. Step three is sometimes easier than step two. Whichever one works for you, but I'm doing all three right now. But on the left-hand side, those are all diverging. Where do they converge? Well, they converge, I'll switch to a different color, they converge back here. So I'm going to just put dashed lines. That represents number one backwards. This is number two backwards. This is number three backwards. Oh man, I'm making it come out perfect. Luckily. All right, so all three of those converge right there in a virtual location. So my image, my image here looks like this. Okay, my flame is a little large, but that's my image. It's a virtual image. I can tell by my diagram, virtual image, and so d sub i will be negative. But let's do the math to confirm this. So once again, it's going to be 1 over d sub o plus 1 over d sub i equals 1 over f. I'm going to plug in 1 over 15 plus 1 over d sub i equals 1 over 25. I'll do the math here. So I did the math. 1 over d sub i equals 1 over 25 minus 1 over 15. OK, 
convert those to decimals. On the homework, you don't need to show every step here, but show a couple steps. And then you get 1 over d sub i is negative 0 0.027. Take the inverse or you know, reciprocal of that. You get d sub i is negative 37. All right, my diagram's not too bad. All right, it's negative. I mean, the negative there tells you it's virtual. So if all you have is a calculation, you know the image is virtual by virtue of the negative in front of the 37. So we know virtual, part A, part B. Image location, negative 37 centimeters. So it's behind the mirror. It's behind the mirror. Just a re as a review, if it were a lens, that would be in front of a lens. But image location is negative behind a mirror. And then C, we have the opposite negative or the opposite of d sub i, so it's a negative negative, negative, the opposite of negative 37 is positive 37 over 15 is 2.5 for our magnification, about two and a half times as large. So I'm a little off on that, but not too bad. All right, example number three. Okay, diverging mirror. Diverging mirror, we have this T-Rex over here. Uh, F, they tell me F. Now, sometimes it'll say F is uh, as a focal length, well, it'll say a diverging mirror with radius. It might say, it might say, um, it might say the radius of this mirror is 40 centimeters. They might not put the negative in there. So you know that the focal length is half of that because F equals one half of R. So you might be tempted to say that F is 20 centimeters. That's the one, that's the absolute value. So you got to remember to put the negative in there. So sometimes it won't have the negative in there, but you have to put the negative in there for the focal length. And that, it already gave it to you in this case. So, well, in this case, let's call this C, our center curvature. So just kind of roughly approximating. So F, okay, come on. F is right there. It's half as far as C. C is 40 centimeters. You could call it negative 40, but F for sure, you got to put in negative 40 into the equation. Now, d sub o, the little t-rex over there, our object, d sub o is 200 centimeters away. I'm going to do everything in centimeters. That's just the more typical way these are done in centimeters. As long as you stay, keep everything in centimeters, it comes out in centimeters. But if I want to then draw the diagram, if I have a ray of light coming in parallel, step one, it reflects such that it reflects as if, now it's not going to go through the lens, the mirror, it's not going to go through the mirror, but if I line up that's supposed to be a straight line through F. So the reflected ray there, let me do a little better uh, than that. Nah, okay, not too bad. That's step one. All right, a ray that comes in parallel reflects as if it comes from F. All right, now I can draw, I can do number two. I can have a ray of light from the T-Rex head towards C. Right, or I can have one that goes towards F and it comes out parallel. So it usually is better. Uh, it doesn't really matter which one you do. But I'm going to do the one. Uh, I'm going to do step two, the one towards C. If I go towards C, so this is going towards C. Right, once again, this is, I can't make excuses here, but it, with a ruler it would be better. So if that line, let me use a different color. Let me use blue. So if that line that I just drew there lined up with C, okay, not too bad, it reflects back, it reflects back, when it hits the mirror, it reflects back this way. Oh, golly. It reflects back on top of itself. Okay, not, not bad. That is step two in our list of rays. Okay, going towards C. And if you have a diverging mirror, you only have to draw those two. The third one, I would never draw the third one here for now. Uh, unless you had good rulers, but where those two lines intersect, I put a red dot. That's our image. Now our image is a T-Rex. I can't draw a T-Rex too well, so I'm just going to draw an arrow. Okay, I'm going to draw an arrow, or just a stick. The top of his head is right there at that X, so it's really small. It'd be the T-Rex, a small T-Rex. Diverging mirrors, like diverging lenses, always give you a virtual small image. So it's less than the focal length, so it's less than negative 20. It looks like about negative 10 or negative 12, negative 15. Let's do the math here to see what it actually is. So it's going to be 1 over d sub 0, d, d sub o, d o, object. It's not, a, it's not a 0, it's an object. Okay, plus 1 over, oh, not plus, come on, rink, equals 1 over f. All right, so 1 over 200 plus 1 over d sub i, 
equals 1 over f. I f, uh, f is negative 20. I fear that I'm a little off on my diagram, but that's okay. So I'm going to have 1 over d sub i equals 1 over negative 20 minus 1 over 200. And, well, here's the completion of the math. 1 over d sub i equals 1 over negative 20 minus 1 over 200. Put those in decimal form. Subtract, you get negative 0 0.055. Take the reciprocal, you get the image distance is negative 18. So my diagram's a little off, but not too bad. I said like negative 15. Well, that'd be generous. But it's a negative, which once again, the negative means it's virtual here, part A. Diverging mirrors, diverging lenses always give you a virtual. They always give you a small. The thing is always smaller than the object, the image is. D sub i, as we see there, is negative 18 by calculation, centimeters. And the magnification is the opposite of negative 18, positive 18 over 200, 0 0.09, like 9% of the height. It's like 9, it's like less than one-tenth of its original height. So it's a tiny T-Rex. Whoa, he, he would have, or she would have, really tiny arms. They just found like a tiny dinosaur somewhere in... I don't know if it was Montana or Wyoming, a tiny, a tiny version of the T-Rex. I, uh, I forget what they named it. You can look that up. It's kind of interesting. They're always finding more and more buried fossils. It's fun. I went out, I, I think I mentioned it before. I went on a fossil dig a couple of years ago in Montana, found a, a rib bone from a duck-billed dinosaur, 17 inches long. It's amazing. It was a fun, I, I recommend that trip to Glendive, Montana and do a dinosaur dig, find dinosaur fossils. It's amazing. They let us keep it. It was on a ranch in, in Glendive, Montana. Uh, Bosch's Dinosaur Dig, B-A-I-S-C-H, if you ever want to have some fun, something different. It was hot. It was hot in the middle of summer, but it was it was extremely uh, different and fun. Anyway, I regress. Uh, I, I'm getting off track here. Let's do one more problem here. Number four. And this one we're not going to draw. We'll just do the calculation like we did, on, I think, number four for the lens problem. It gives us some uh, conditions here. It says an image is 13.5 centimeters from a convex mirror. Kind of like the problem we just did. So they're giving us, they're giving us d sub i. Now the thing is, I have to say it's negative 13.5. It didn't tell me the negative 13. So you have to know that if you have a convex mirror, the image is always negative, so you gotta put that in there. It says, it just says an image is that far from the mirror. Well, it's gotta be behind, it's gotta be virtual. So that's where the really tricky part of this one comes in. You gotta know enough about these and look these up or keep, have these memorized. Convex, which is a diverging mirror, the back side of a spoon, or a security camera, or a security mirror in a store, are like this, always a virtual image. And it says that the magnification is 0 0.280. M equals 0 0.280. It says that right above here. And that's a positive number because that's a virtual image. It'll always be a positive number. If it says it's a real image, you've got to make that a negative. Then I just plug into the uh, equation for m equals negative d sub i over d sub o. So I have 0 0.280 equals negative negative 13.5 over d sub o. So if you do the math here, you're going to get d sub o is positive 13.5 divided by 0 0.280. Because the opposite of a negative 13 is positive 13. So d sub o is 48 centimeters, positive. Well, now we have d sub o. We want to get the, uh, the locate. Oh, we didn't. That's part A. Location of the object. That's part A. Now we want to get the radius of curvature. But for the radius of curvature, I'm going to go back over here to the left. We want to find the focal length first. So I have 1 over d sub o plus 1 over d sub i equals 1 over f. So I have 1 over 48 plus... 1 over negative 13.5 equals 1 over f. And I finished it off over here. 1 over 48 is 0 0.021 minus 0 0.074 when you divide. Subtract those two. You get a negative 0 0.053 equals 1 over f. Reciprocal, reciprocate that. You get a focal length of negative 19. And you, and you better get a negative number because it's a diverging mirror convex mirror has a negative focal length. And then you go to the middle here. F is one half R. That means R equals 2F. Radius of curvature. So 2 times negative 19 is negative 38. And if you just said positive 38, I would give it to you. 
the radius of curvature, diverging mirror, negative 38 centimeters. So there we have a geometric optics. We went from Snell's law uh, to the application with lenses and now to the application with mirrors, ray diagrams, and application of the, the lens equation, 1 over d sub o plus 1 over d sub i equals 1 over f for real and virtual images. And next up will be the function of applicate, applying this to the, to the eye. and the wonders of how the eye works, and how corrective lenses work, how the eye perceives color. A lot of really fun and interesting things, and the wonder of the eye.